Hey everybody, I'm giving this a try. So this is no, this is nothing to do with the rock pile. This is nothing to do with the Mohawk Valley Sports Watch. This is just Coach talking some college football tonight on Facebook Live. First time I've done this in a long time. Uh, if you got any comments, questions, you want to ask me anything college football related, let's do it. I'm going to roll for about a half hour or so here. So hopefully some folks will join and talk some sports with me here tonight. One of the things I want to get into is I want to know what the Syracuse fans that are out there, and I know there's a lot of them. I'm neutral. Um, as I used to say on the on Sports Watch with the guys, I'm part of the media, so I try to stay neutral. The stat man would say, I don't like Syracuse. Not true. How do you rate Fran Brown through nine games? Six and three. Losses to Stanford, which they shouldn't have lost that game. The loss at Pitt, where they got annihilated, 41-13. And then most recently, the loss at Boston College, where Boston College and, and Coach O'Brien uh, played some defense, ran the football, and Syracuse couldn't stop them. What's your thoughts? How would you grade them? I'll give you my grade. I give them a B. I'm in like that B, maybe B minus. Um, and here's the reason why. I think the schedule's been pretty good for Syracuse this year. I think it's a schedule where most people, when – the schedules came out before the season started, could say, yeah, maybe the game against Miami at the end of the year, um, the winner gets in, or maybe Syracuse is competing for, and I don't know, top two, top three in the ACC. But how would you rate Fran Brown? I think he's done okay. My My question to people is if this was Dino Babers, through nine games, where would they, where do you think they'd be? Do you think they'd be six and three? I think Fran Brown's done an okay job. I think special teams is um, hasn't been the greatest this year. I think defensively, I thought they'd be a little bit better. Um, I thought they'd be a little bit better stopping the run than what they have been um, through the, at least the last couple of weeks. But what what do you think of Fran Brown? So the remaining schedule for Syracuse. At Cal this week, they get Connecticut that's over 500, but Connecticut hasn't played anybody. So I'm not going to really go too much into Connecticut, but Connecticut may make a bowl game. And then they play Miami at the Dome, which we all know probably if Miami wins that game and Miami finishes, they get to the ACC title game. Miami's probably in the 12-team playoff. I think we can we can agree to that. But 6-3, and three, they should beat Cal. They should beat Connecticut. That's eight and three. And then, I don't know, you take your chances against Miami at, at home. Maybe you're nine and three, eight and four. But as a Syracuse fan, are you happy with eight and four? Are you happy with eight and four and going to a bowl game? And I know people will say, you know, the expectations at Syracuse over the years is let's get to a bowl game. Let's go six and six. Let's go seven and five. Let's get to a bowl game. It's more practice for the kids, blah, 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 blah right? The rest is history. I think you got to go at least eight and four with this team. I think you, I think eight and four with the schedule that they've had this season. I think they should be a little bit better. I think they should have never lost the game to Stanford. That's a bad loss for Stanford. Stanford's not a good team. Pitt they got select at Pitt. McCord played absolutely atrocious against Pitt, and then Boston College typical Bill O'Brien. He's going to run the football and he's going to play defense, and Syracuse couldn't stop him. So I'm not surprised. I actually thought this was a Syracuse team this year that could probably win nine games, possibly ten. Coach Medesis and Pags and I and the stat men always say Syracuse has the, the schedule every year where they have to win the 50-50 games, the Wake Forest, the Georgia Techs, um, Pitt, Boston College, NC State. Like Those are the games where – they should be in games with a chance to compete. Now you throw in Cal, throw in Stanford. I think those are two winnable games every year. I think Cal's better than I thought they were going to be this year. Um, Stanford's been atrocious for the last two or three years. I feel like Stanford hasn't been any good since Jim Harbaugh was there. But when the schedules came out, you always say, you could see six wins for Syracuse. The first two, three games, usually they play Colgate, Florida, and they don't usually play anybody the first couple weeks. But when this schedule came out, I really said to myself, I think Syracuse has a shot to get to the playoff, especially with the 12 teams. 
ACC. I didn't know how good Clemson was going to be. We knew Miami was going to be pretty good. Um, but where, where, where was everybody else? Wake's been down. Virginia Tech came in, I think, with uh, high expectations. And they've been kind of a disappointment so far this year. But how would you rate Fran Brown? I give him a B, B minus, because I think the schedule's been um, in favor of Syracuse. I don't think he's done anything where you say, wow, Fran Brown makes that much of a difference. I don't know. Maybe the in game stuff. I thought Dino Babers was terrible. Clock management down the stretch. Um, I, I didn't think he made a lot of good in game adjustments. I mean, Fran Brown's a good preacher. At the end of games, if you listen to his press conferences, I love listening to him. I think his most recent one, I think he said that after a loss, he doesn't shower because only winners, only winners shower. And eh, it might go a little bit too far for me, you know, Fran Brown. But the players seem to like him. He got Kyle McCord, who, as I look through my numbers, 23 touchdowns, the 12 interceptions. I don't think he's played well the last couple weeks. He's over 3,000 yards passing. He's averaging 350 yards per game, and that's good for fourth in the nation. What I'm surprised at, as a team, right now Syracuse is only averaging 89 yards rushing. That's 248th in the country. They got LaQuentin Allen. How is that possible where Syracuse can't run the football? Or is it they got Kyle McCord, you know, let's let's dump dump it into the backfield, let's let's throw the quick three yards into the flats, the quick passing game, the screens and all that are really like run plays, and that's part of the offense. I get it. I think Kyle McCord's been great for Syracuse. The funny thing to me about Kyle McCord is this. He was one pass away from beating Michigan last year, and he's probably Ohio State's quarterback this year, who, by the way, I think he's better than Will Howard, but that's a question maybe for a topic for maybe later down the road here tonight. I don't know. We'll see. It depends on what kind of mood I'm in. But just think of that. If you watch the Ohio State game last year against Michigan, Ohio State had the ball. They threw the interception late. Michigan ran the clock out. Game was over. Kyle McCord played pretty good in that game against Michigan. With the weapons that Ohio State has this year, which, by the way, my wife and I were at the game last week. Um, wasn't a fun game. Purdue was terrible. But it was still fun to go sit with 100,000 people. But Kyle McCord's been good. And I think what's really neat about everything with Syracuse this year and Fran Brown is if you're on social media a lot like I am, and it's nice. You go on Twitter, you see, hey, you know, this person is this four star, five star has Syracuse on his radar. We would have never saw that with Dino Babers. We didn't see that. And I think Fran Brown, listen, between Fran Brown and his other two assistant coaches, they have three of the best recruiters in the entire country. That includes himself. So Syracuse in recruiting and the transfer portal, Fran Brown's going to do a hell of a job. They're going to get players. The question is. Can he win games? And maybe next year the schedule is a little bit different. I don't know. We'll have to wait and see when it comes out. But are you happy with six and three through nine games? That's my question. I think they should be at least seven and two. I think the Stanford 26-24 is a bad loss for them. Um, I thought they should have beaten, could have beaten Boston College. I think they laid an egg against Pitt. I think Pitt was physical. I think Boston College was physical. Not sure Cal is going to be as physical. Connecticut ain't going to be physical. And then Miami, at the end of the year, they got a lot of athletes. So I can realistically, I could see eight and four, not giving them too much of a chance to beat Miami, but eight and four, you happy with that as a Syracuse fan? Let me know if you're listening, tuning in. Let me know if you're happy with that. Again, I give Fran Brown a B. Moving on to coaches, is there anybody that's done a better job than, I'll give you a Two coaches here, and I'm going to get into a little bit about both of them. One of them is Coach Prime. I'm all over Coach Prime. I was when he got the job at Colorado. Um, I'm on the Prime bandwagon. I should have worn my my Prime shirt tonight, my sweatshirt um, that I have. But look at the job that he's done. And I know a lot of people. A lot of people want to see him lose, and I think they want to see him lose because of his style. And one thing I'll say about Prime. The way he played the game is the way he coaches. The cameras, the bright lights, the press conferences, the music, the dancing. Um, if you follow his son, I think it's Well Off Media on YouTube. Follow it because I, I think you get a good insight on the entire program. 
And people were all over him when he came in because he said, I'm brewing, bringing my luggage, I'm bringing Louie with me, and he advised everybody to hit the portal. And people were like, oh, my God, Dion's coming in. He's just getting rid of everybody, blah, 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 blah. Colorado was and has been one of the worst college football programs in the country for I don't know how many years. And in the, in the days from years ago when, uh, I mean, Rick Neuheisel was there, Gary Barnett was there, and, and Colorado back in the day was was really good. I got an itch. Um, and when he took over that program, last year they got off to the great start. I think they were like 3-0, 4-0, they were ranked. And then next thing you know, they finished 4-8, and and the world's like, oh, well, Dion can't coach. His roster was terrible. And Shador Sanders was one of the most sacked quarterbacks in the country. Last year they couldn't run the football. They couldn't stop anybody. Now you watch this year. They probably have the two best players in the country that are probably going to go one, two in the draft. And I keep saying this, and people are going to disagree with me on this. Shador Sanders is the best quarterback in college football. I know you got Quinn Ewers. I think Quinn Ewers is really good. We'll see if he translates to the next level. Carson Beck has just destroyed his status here this season. I don't know if Carson Beck's trying to do too much um, and make too many plays, or Georgia really doesn't have the playmakers on the outside that they've had in the last two or three years since Kirby Smart's been there. They've been really good defensively. I don't think this year defensively they've been what they've been in the past, but it's still Georgia. So I'm not 100% sure where you would rank them. I think Garrett Nussmeyer, the quarterback from LSU, is going to be um, a first-round kid too. Cam Ward's going to be right up there. He's going to be um, one of the leading contenders for the Heisman Trophy, and he should be. But look at the job and sit back and say to yourself, what Coach Prime has done. They're 7-2. and two. The crazy thing right now about Colorado is this. If they went out, they're in the college football playoff. Just put that in perspective. Can you imagine America, what they would do, what they would say if Prime gets into the playoff? Just think about that. Coach Prime at Oh, I'm looking at my notes. They win the next three games. They're 10-2. and two. They're in the Big 12 title game against BYU, who should have lost to Utah. And, um, I don't know. I don't, they haven't played anybody, have they, BYU? But they're good, and that's who's going to be in the Big 12 title game. Unless something crazy happens if Colorado loses or BYU loses or something crazy happens, which we've seen in college football. It could happen. But I want you to put this in perspective. They just went into Texas Tech last week. And, and beat Texas Tech 41-27. And Texas Tech came off a win where they went into Iowa State names and beat Iowa State, a good football team. But now Iowa State's dropped a couple in a row, so now everybody's saying, well, that's not really a good win. Um, they're going to play Utah this week at home. Utah, no Cam Rising. They just fired their offensive coordinator. They're not as physical as they've been, not one of the better Utah teams. But let's be real, they also don't have Cam Rising, who's been there since, I don't know, He's been there the last eight years, and I think he just got another season where if he wants to come back for year number nine, he can, but I think he said, I think Utah is done with me. I'm done with college football. Can you imagine that? Nine years playing college football, and the poor kids had some injuries. So that completely demolished Utah's season. They're not going in at Boulder and beating Coach Prime. So I'm going to give Dion another win there. Then they go play at Kansas, who they Kansas was one of those teams before the year started. Um, Daniels, their quarterback, was a really good athlete. They were preseason, I think, top 25, and I even think at one point they were preseason top 15 in some polls. They've been horrendous, um, but you never know. Um, that's at Kansas. But I think Colorado's got too much skill on the back end. And remember this. Most of the time in the portal, teams are built from the inside out. And what I mean by that is they start with the trenches. And they go inside out. You got to protect the quarterback. You got to be able to run the football, whether it's high school, college, or the NFL. You need to be able to run the football and protect the quarterback. Coach Prime did something we haven't seen, and that's build it from the outside in. He's got arguably the best skilled guys in the country. I will put Colorado's skill kids up against anybody in college football today, hands down. I don't care who it is Ohio State, Alabama, Georgia, Ole Miss. Uh, Whoever you want to put, Colorado skill kids are unbelievable. Travis Hunter, my eye, should win the Heisman Trophy. He's the best player in college football. It goes back to the year where Charles Woodson 
won the Heisman Trophy, played some offense, played some defense, played special teams, and everybody um, thought Peyton Manning, who had the record or had all the records, the numbers, the stats, um, everything else, they thought he was going to win the Heisman Trophy. And people are saying maybe it's Cam Ward. Maybe it's Dylan Gabriel, the quarterback from Oregon, who's having a great year, too. I'm not as sold on him. I know if Cody's listening to me tonight, he's going to say, but Dylan Gabriel, the Ducks, they're having a really good year, and I think Gabriel's had a really good year. I'm not sure he translates to the NFL. I, I don't know. I'm not 100% sure. Just my gut says I, I don't see it, but I think he's had a really good year. I think he'll be a finalist. I think Cam Ward's going to be a finalist. I think Shador Sanders, Travis Hunter, and then Aston Beatty, the running back from Boise State. Um, you know, he'll be a finalist, too. Maybe he wins it. But I think if you watch college football this season, I mean, Colorado's been on TV a lot this year, and I think they're on TV again this week. I, I think they're the 330 game against Utah, I think, or maybe they're the noon game on Fox. I have no idea. But if you watch them and you see that Travis Hunter, what he's doing on both sides of the ball, I he's playing like 100 snaps a game. And I think the difference this year for Colorado is they can run the football. Defensively, they're pretty good up front. And, you know, those skilled guys on the outside are are phenomenal. They're going to score points. And that's why I think if they win out, and you don't want to, you, you want to go game by game. And I'm sure Coach Prime and the team will do that. He'll keep them focused. But if they win out and they play BYU in the Big 12 title game, they're going to out athlete BYU. Colorado's got better athletes. Now we'll see BYU the next two, three weeks. We'll see how they fare. And, you know, if Colorado does win out, they beat BYU, they're in the playoff, and they're going to get a home game because they're going to be one of the four teams that are going to get by. But is there anybody in, in college football this year that saw this coming with Coach Prime? And I think the sad thing is for, for some football fans, they want to see him lose. And he knows that. And nobody uses that more for motivation than Deion Sanders and, and his coaching staff. Everybody wants him to lose. They don't like his style. They don't like the gold chains. They don't like the music. They don't like all the, the glamour and all that. And I say this. He's going to get players to go to Colorado. With this whole NIL thing, Prime does not belong in, in the NFL. I've seen a lot of things this past week. He's got a really good relationship with Jerry Jones. And they're saying, well, the Cowboys should tank so they can get Shador and Dion. Dion's to me, is not meant for the NFL game. Dion is really good for college football. Now, if someday down the road this NIL thing changes, they get a commissioner or a general manager of um, the NIL, and they put some rules and regulations on it, maybe. But right now, if you're prime or a lot of these coaches, you can build a team in year one. You can win year one. So years ago, if if you if you got let's say, and I'll and I'll get into Kurt Signetti here in a little bit, but you get the Indiana job or Colorado, right? We're talking about Coach Prime. Those are horrible programs where, okay, you got to recruit the high school kid. Maybe you get a transfer. Maybe you get a JUCO kid. It's going to take you two or three years. And and now it's like, is there a bad college job in America today with the transfer portal? Is there? Kurt Signetti's undefeated at ten and all. But we'll get into that. I don't think they've played anybody yet, but hats off to Signetti. I like him. All he does is win. Google me. That's what he says. But nowadays, the way things are set up, you can win. And I think Coach Prime is going to do it. Now, there's one job in America I think he'd be interested in. Florida's going to bring Billy Napier back, and I think they should because of the buyout. And I think they got to give some of these coaches more time. So hats off to Billy Napier. I hope he gets it right, and I hope it's a good story. He can say, you know, I was on the verge of getting fired. We turned it around. My kids stayed with me. They've been competitive this year. He's been going through injuries. Billy Napier gets another year. However, how about Florida State? Florida State. Mike Norvell is going to probably get a pass. But Mike Norvell, I think Florida State is 1-9. in nine right now, or 1-10, in I don't know. They got one win, and I think they beat at FCS school earlier in the year, and they've been really bad. Notre Dame just beat the living snot out of them last week. If that job, let's say the AD at Florida State calls Deion and says, listen, coach, we want you to come back home. I think Deion's got to listen. I know he's been he's been loyal to uh, Colorado. It seems like Prime really likes it in Colorado. Um, Again, if 
if you go on Well Off Media and you read the story and you watch the videos, I think he really does like it there. I think it's a good fit for him. But if you're if you're Florida State, I really think behind the scenes, you pick the phone up, you call Deion Sanders, and you talk Florida State and say, "Do we got a shot?" Now Deion may say, "What what's what's it going to cost?" He's got a lot of money. I think he just they just said he made about four hundred thousand in incentives. Every game he wins from here on out, it's an extra hundred grand. Colorado is a place similar to me, and we always talk about Wake Forest because I'm. Everybody, I think, by now over the last 10 years knows that I'm a huge Dave Clawson guy because I played for Coach Clawson when he was at Fordham, is if you can go to a school like Colorado and you you go to a bowl game and you're competing for the Big 12 title now, you're a hero. Like, the expectations there compared to the expectations at Florida State, Florida, um, Alabama, um, Georgia, and those schools is not even close. Not even close. Colorado, Alabama, not even close. So if you're Coach Prime and you want to stay where you're at and you're happy with the NIL, I think he's going to continue to get players, and I think they're going to continue to be better and better every year. But Mike Norvell, I think, will get a pass. And the reason why I think Norvell gets a pass is the season they had last year. And you remember 13-0, and Jordan Travis – the horrible injury the quarterback when he got hurt basically cost Florida State a chance to play in the playoff, which I think was crazy. I still think, regardless of who was at quarterback for Florida State, they belonged in. A lot will argue that and say, well, you got to put the four best teams. Is Florida State one of the best four teams? They were undefeated and belonged in, regardless of Rocky Corgliano was quarterbacking for them or whoever, they belonged in the playoff last year. Okay, fast forward now to this year. Mike Norvell fires his offense and defensive coordinator. He's firing the entire staff. That's because I think the AD said, listen, coach, you got to get rid of people. You got to make changes. This is this is horrendous. We can't do this. We're Florida State. Imagine if they lose to Florida. I think that game's coming up, or maybe it's the Miami game. One of the two is coming up for Florida State at the end of the year. I'm not sure if it's Miami or, or Florida. I think it's Florida because Miami's going to play Syracuse at the end of the year. But how crazy would it be? to see primetime Deion Sanders, who, by the way, when I was being recruited my junior year at RFA, my dad and I went down. I got invited to go to Florida State for their quarterback and receiver camp. And at the time, Mark Rick was a quarterback coach, um, who everybody knows Mark Rick was the offensive coordinator there, and then was the head coach at Georgia, and then was the head coach at Miami. And I remember we were in a team meeting, and it was an overnight camp, so we stayed overnight. and. We sit down, and Bobby Bowden comes out, and he goes, I'm going to show you guys one of the best highlight films you'll ever see. And if you think about the athletes that have come through Florida State over the years, a lot of good ones, a lot of good ones at Florida State. So Bobby Bowden says, I'm going to put on Deion Sanders' highlight film. When I tell you it was the best highlight film I've ever seen in my entire life, it was ridiculous to see how good he was. So to get a call and try to bring him home, Florida State's got more resources and money than Colorado does. You know, Florida State and that ACC, it's not the Big Ten or the SEC. You got to listen. Got to listen if you're Coach Prime. I'm pumped up. I got my Prime sweatshirt. Um, I'm pulling for him. I hope they get. To, I hope they went out and get a shot to play um, in the playoffs. So hats off to Coach Prime. And the other one I want to talk about is this. I think it's a really good story. I think the really good story, I think, is Kurt Signetti, um, who is the coach for Indiana. And I, I think one of the things about Signetti, he's won everywhere he's been. And I think one of the best interviews that I've heard is if you go on when he got the job at Indiana, he, I don't know who he was interviewing with. It was one of the TV stations. And he says, all I do is win. Google me. He was an assistant under Nick Saban. He went to a Division II school to be a head coach because he wanted to be a head coach. He didn't want to be a 50-year-old assistant coach. He won at a Division II school. He took a pay cut to go be a head coach. And then he got the job at James Madison, who was an FCS school. And all he did there was win a national championship. And then JMU transitions last year to... Um, FBS, and all he does is win that year, 
And now he gets a job at Indiana. When he got this job at Indiana, everybody, including myself, said, not a good job, right? But it's a Big Ten, and the Big Ten and SEC right now have eight of the 12 teams in the college football playoff. You got the Big Ten network, so there's a lot of perks. Um, and Bloomington's a nice place, but Indiana, let's be real, Bob Knight, it's a basketball school. But, man, I'll tell you what, Kurt Signetti's got that place rocking. And he's got that place believing. And that's one thing I think as a coach, and this is for any level. This was for this could be for high school coaches. When I was coaching and my dad was coaching, and this is one thing I learned from my dad. He's he's probably listening. So, Dad, if you're listening, I'm giving you a shout out here. There was never a game my dad coached where he didn't believe he could win. And that rubs off on your players. And there were a lot of games. Listen, as high school coaches, you go in, you say to yourself on paper, you look at the schedule and say, okay, there's probably five or six games I think we can we can be competitive. And then eh, there's a couple teams, you know, we, we got to go fight. For us back in the day, it was always Dodgeville and Westmoreland where the two powerhouses. West Canada was really good. And then the rest of the five, we'd say, I think we got a shot. Let's go week to week. But there was a, never a game, a practice, a meeting, where we didn't think we could win. And I think that's what's great about Kurt Signetti. He walked into Indiana before a basketball game or at halftime, and he got up in front of everybody and he said, you know what? He goes, Ohio State stinks, Michigan stinks, Purdue stinks. And now he's got Indiana at 10-0. Now, I'm not going to get on him, but I was looking at their schedule the other day, and I'm just going to read you the schedule. FIU, not very good. Western Illinois, not very good. At UCLA, UCLA is playing really much better right now. So I'm going to say, eh, okay, maybe. Charlotte, not very good. Maryland struggling this year in the Big Ten. Northwestern, not very good um, this year. Nebraska, at Nebraska, they throttled Nebraska. I don't know what's going on with Nebraska. They started off really good, and here they are at five wins. They're stuck on five, and they may not make a bowl game. But so Nebraska, yeah, okay. At the time, looked okay. You beat them up at Nebraska, but now Nebraska can't beat can't beat anybody. Washington, okay. I think Washington. I think the job, um, the Jed Fish has done there. Remember, Washington was in the national championship last year against Michigan, and they lost everybody. They still they've been competitive, and he's done a pretty good job there. Michigan State, the Michigan game last week. Um, which I'll get into in a minute. They're going to play at Ohio State and then Purdue. The game's at Ohio State next week, which, by the way, I tried to get tickets for that, but who would have thought the tickets for Ohio State, Indiana, would be like four or 500 bucks a ticket? But who would have thought that Indiana, Ohio State, that the winner is going to go play for the Big Ten Championship? And think of it this way. What if Indiana beats Ohio State and Ohio State's got two losses and Indiana, Oregon play for the Big Ten title? Does Ohio State sneak in with two losses? Maybe. Probably, I guess. But more we can talk about. So I think Coach Prime and Signetti right now are your probably guys in the clubhouse that are leading for Coach of the Year. And I think it's they're both great stories. I think to me, if I had to give it to somebody right now, I'd probably give it to Signetti because it's Indiana. Um, Again, they've been really bad um, over the years. But again, you're going to get that game against Ohio State, which my wife's upstairs. I don't don't think my wife's listening to me. We were down in CBUS last week, and I got a chance to meet up with my, my good buddy, Nick, who does the college sports podcast with me, uh, the No Huddle Podcast and my best buddy, uh, Vinny uh, Galupi from Rome. I got a chance to have a few beers with those guys, and you know, we got a chance to talk football. And I said it in front of my wife, who's a Buckeye fan. I said, if you guys remember, in the preseason, in the summertime, yours truly, the Michigan guy, picked Ohio State to win the national championship. And I'm staying with it. I'm not going to change it. I think Ohio State the, is the best team in the country. And what really proved to me a little bit more about Ohio State I still don't think Will Howard's the answer, although he's played better. Ohio State hasn't played anybody either yet. They haven't played anybody. I know they played Penn State, and Penn State's really good. 
I think Penn State's a team that, um, you know, James Franklin every year gets the bad rap that James Franklin can't beat anybody. I think he's lost the last nine years in a row to Ohio State. I think he's like one in ten in big games. But who does win big games, right? I mean, Nick Saban won big games. Kirby Smart's won big games. But if you're one in ten, chances are you're playing big games every year. And I know as Penn State alum, listen, last year we were at Michigan Penn State. They don't like him. I don't think they're a big fan of James Franklin until you can beat Michigan, until you can beat Ohio State. I think he's got a team this year defensively. They're really good. If they get into the playoff, which they should, and they get a team like Ole Miss or Notre Dame to come play them at Happy Valley um, in December, possibly in snow with that defense, good luck. But Ohio State, Indiana is going to be really intriguing because I think Indiana struggled against Michigan up front. If Michigan had any offense, Michigan would have beat Indiana. I don't think Michigan's defense is anywhere near it's been the last two or three years. I'm not a big Wink Martindale guy. I think the job that Jesse Minner did um, with Michigan um, is lights out. And if you look in the NFL and you look to see what Mike McDonald and Jesse Minner, guess who's got the best defense in the NFL? The Chargers. Guess who's the defensive coordinator for the Chargers? That guy, Jesse Minner, who was the Michigan defensive coordinator. Yeah, yeah, they cheated, Rocky. They cheated. They had the plays. They had better coaches, and they had better players than anybody. I'm over the sign-stealing thing. Teams do it. If you watch the documentary and, and, and you watch Connor Stallings, he said, there's teams today, including teams in the Big Ten, big teams, who he wouldn't mention, have been doing it for years. It goes on. Who cares? Now you got the helmets where they talk to the quarterback so they get away with it. But that's why Michigan won the national champ. They cheated. Well, they cheated. They had better players and they had better coaching. That's why. But anyways, back to Ohio State and Indiana. I think Ohio State beats them by two or more scores. I don't think Indiana. I think Indiana struggled inside interior against Michigan's front. I think Ohio State's front's as good, if not better, than Michigan. And I think Ohio State on the back end is better um, than Michigan. Um, Will Johnson, who I think has been a complete disappointment for Michigan fans, hasn't played the last three weeks, I think. And who knows, he may not even play another snap this year for Michigan. But I don't think Indiana has seen it. I mean, listen, I'm going to root for Indiana because I, I want to see Signetti win a big game at Ohio State in front of 100,000 people, but I don't see it happening. Um, so I, I, I like Ohio State by a couple scores. But hats off to him. What a great job that, um, you know, Signetti's done. How about a couple big games that I would just want to get into the playoff race? Uh, and then I got some predictions I want to give, and then I'm going to wrap up here. I don't want to go too long tonight. Um, Ole Miss, Georgia last week. Ole Miss was phenomenal. And one thing about Ole Miss, and I've been on the lane train since he got the job at Ole Miss, and if my buddy Pat Paslock was listening, him and I were on lane when he got this job at Ole Miss. And um, I'm a huge lane guy, huge lane guy. I think he does a fantastic job calling plays. I think his players like him. I think I don't think he's going anywhere. Some people thought he was going to get the Florida job if it was open. If you watched the game last week against Georgia, which, by the way, they held Georgia to 10 points. Here's the stat for me. I think Ole Miss is going to be dangerous, and I picked Ole Miss to get to the playoff at the beginning of the year. They held Georgia. You ready for this? I'm going to look at my sheet. Normally my notes are on my screen. Tonight they're not because I'm not doing it in my studio. They held Georgia the 50 yards of rushing. Carson Beck had a turnover. Jackson Dart was sensational for, for Ole Miss in, in a downpour. It was horrible out there in Ole Miss. Ole Miss got better defensively, and Ole Miss got physical, and Ole Miss won the game in the trenches, which is something that, oh, I don't know, Ole Miss really isn't known for, but Lane Kiffin last year after they got throttled by Georgia said, to beat Georgia and some of the big teams, you got to be physical. Well, they're physical. They're going to be a tough out for anybody if they get in. The other one I just want to talk about, Alabama throttled LSU. Jalen Milrow was fantastic. Rushed for 185 yards in that game. LSU, Brian Kelly still can't stop a running quarterback. They had two weeks to prepare for Alabama and got throttled at home. Throttled. And now everybody's saying, well, don't count out a three-loss LSU team or a three-loss SEC team for getting in. Slow down. Let's see how this thing plays out um, over the next couple weeks. And then big game this week is, you know, Georgia's going to play Tennessee. 
So we get the 12-team playoffs, and here's here's what we got so far. Oregon, Texas, BYU, Miami, they're the four automatics. They're the four buys right now. They're your conference leaders in the clubhouse. Oregon's in the driver's seat. They're going to probably they're going to play either Ohio State, Indiana. The winner of that game's going to get in. It's probably going to be Ohio State. And if you remember, I was in Nashville for this, but Will Howard goes down. They kick a field goal to win. They beat Oregon. I think Ohio State beats Oregon if they play again. And I think Ohio State gets the bye. Uh, but we'll see. I think Dan Lanning's done a fantastic job at Oregon. I I wasn't a big Lanning fan, but he's growing on me every week. Um, so right now you got Oregon, Texas. Oh, Texas has one loss. They don't really have a good win this year. So I don't know. But Sark's done a good job in his, in his first year. BYU, I don't know. Big 12, I think, stinks. You know, BYU's going to probably get Iowa State, Colorado, um, Kansas State. I don't know. We'll see. Um, the winner of that will get a bye. Miami, I don't know. Who are they going to play? Clemson in the ACC title game? Clemson uh, Clemson don't look that great. If Clemson beats Miami, you're going to put a two-loss ACC team in? I don't know. Possibly. Um, we'll have to see. So right now the matchups would be this. Number eight, Tennessee, would play Notre Dame. That would be at Tennessee. I think it would be a really good game. Not many people are talking the Irish. Not many people remember that Notre Dame's loss was to NIU. But like in college basketball, they lost early, and now nobody remembers it. But if you lose late, they remember. Just like March Madness, right? In college basketball, well, if you lose late, it hurts you. If you lose early, nobody nobody remembers it. That would be a really good matchup. Right now, I'd probably say I'd favor Tennessee, but we'll see. How about Ohio State, Boise State? 5-12, Boise State would have to go travel, um, play Ohio State. That's a bad matchup for Boise State. Ohio State's good at stopping the run. Not sure if Boise State can throw the ball, but what if Boise State loses? What if Army beats Notre Dame? Man, I don't know. Does Army get in? Nobody's talking about Army with no losses. Um, so a lot of things to, to look at. Another intriguing matchup, number seven, Indiana, would get a home game against number 10, Alabama. This is where it gets interesting because some, some people are going to say, okay, you could have five SEC teams with two losses. Missouri's only got two losses. Ole Miss has two. Tennessee has two. Georgia has two. Bama has two. Georgia's going to play Tennessee this week. What if Georgia loses and has three losses on a neutral field? This is what I want you to think about. Does a three-loss LSU lose to Indiana? Does a two-loss Georgia go down and play Indiana at Indiana and lose? Right now, any of those SEC teams, if they play Indiana, and I just saw this today, they're a two-touchdown favorite on the road at Indiana. So think about it. We debate every year when it was a 14 playoff, we'd say, well, what about five and six? Now we're saying, okay, here's the 12. Now we're debating who's got three losses. Do they belong in? Or if it's a two-loss Big Ten team, what if Ohio State's sitting there with two losses and Indiana Oregon are in a Big Ten title game? And let's say Oregon beats Indiana, which I think they would. Indiana's got one loss. Penn State's got one loss. Ohio State's got two. Oregon's undefeated. You'd have to put all four in, right? So eight of the 12 teams would be SEC and Big Ten. The other ones would be this. Penn State would play Ole Miss. Ole Miss would have to travel to Penn State. Again, against that defense, good luck. I mean, let's be real. When Penn State played Ohio State, Penn State had the ball inside the five going in for a score. And listen, I'm not the smartest guy in the, in the shed, and I'll never criticize coaches. They put a 285-pound lineman in the slot receiver and motioned him and ran the ball four times straight at him. Didn't even use the big guy to block. And again, I'm not a genius. There's other coaches that are a hell of a lot smarter than me. But if I'm on the five-yard line, if you want to put your 285-pound lineman in, in the game, put him in the backfield and run behind the big guy and try to get in. They didn't get in. If they get in, 
Maybe that changes the outcome. It's probably 20 to 20, and I'm sure James Franklin would still find a way to lose the game. But Penn State's a player two away from beating Ohio State, and Ohio State was a player two from beating Oregon on the road. So I think the playoffs going to get really good. I don't know if Ole Miss can come against that defense, but if there's anybody in the country who's a mastermind on offense, Lane Kiffin picked apart Kirby Smart's defense. And I know people are going to say, well, Ole Miss, Lane Kiffin got beat to Kentucky. Kentucky's not very good. I don't know. They slipped. They played bad. On any given day, anybody in college football, you can lose. You can lose, right? Anybody. Any given day, you can lose. There's been teams that have been 20, 30 point underdogs that have went in late today and they won. So I think that would be a really intriguing matchup. And I, as I said right now, eight of the 12 teams that are in, and there's a lot of football to be played, are the Big Ten and SEC. All right, I want to get to these predictions. I'm going to cut things loose tonight. I appreciate you for tuning in tonight again. I apologize. It's the first time I've ever did this Facebook Live thing. I thought it would be cool. We'll see. Maybe I'll do it every week, talk some college football with you guys for a quick half hour. I'm not picking all the games, but I do have a handful. The first game is Utah that's 4-5 and five at Colorado that's 7-2. and two. How about this line? Colorado is minus 10 at home. That's a big number, but it's not the same Utah team. I'm going to take Colorado. I'm going to take Colorado laying the 10 points. I think they they cover, they beat Utah, and they go to 8-2. Big one in the ACC, number 23, Clemson at 7-2, at number 18, Pitt at 7-2. Clemson was playing really well. Then they kind of came back to reality. They haven't looked really good. I don't know. Pittsburgh's physical. Pittsburgh can't beat Clemson. It's on. It's at home for Pitt. I'm going to take Clemson on the road in this one. You can probably flip a coin 10 times, um, but I am going to go with Clemson on the road, and I think Clemson keeps their their playoff hope alive. Number five, Texas at Arkansas. Arkansas is a 13-and-a-half-point favorite. I think Arkansas um, will not cover. I'm going to say that. Um, But I think Arkansas has been better this year than I think people thought, Um, and I do think that – Arkansas, I think they're going to, I think he's going to save his job. And I can't, I mean, Bo Pelini, not Bo Pelini. Um, I'm thinking of the Louisville guy. I'm drawing a blank, but that's okay. Um, is I don't think Arkansas is going to cover the 13. I think Texas rolls them, but I think Arkansas has been better um, this year. Boston College 5 and 4 will play at SMU. SMU is a 17 and a half point favorite at home. How about SMU? What if SMU wins out, beats Miami in the ACC title game? SMU is in the playoff. Um, I like SMU, um, but I'm going to say this. I don't think they cover the 17 and a half. I think Boston College is going to run the football. They made a quarterback change this week. Um, so I'm going to go SMU, but I'm going to go BC plus the 17 and a half. LSU six and three. They're going to play at Florida. That's four and five. That's in the swamp. Um, I'm going to go with LSU. I think Billy Napier deserved another shot this year. They've battled injuries this year. DJ Lagley's been banged up, but I think he's going to give it a go this week. I think Florida plays hard in the swamp. It's going to be interesting to see what LSU team shows up because I still think they got an outside chance to get in. Florida's got to win the last couple games to um, the three games that they have left. They got to win at least two of the three to get in um, to be eligible for a bowl game. I think that'd be good for Florida, but I'm going to go LSU. I think they come out. I think Brian Kelly's got them ready to play. Missouri at 7-2 and two at South Carolina. South Carolina, what a fantastic year South Carolina's had. South Carolina's a 12-point favorite at home. They're playing really good at the right time. They're really good defensively. They can run the football. I love Shane Beamer. I think he's done a fantastic job at South Carolina. I'm going to go South Carolina, and I'm also going to say I think they cover the 12. And who would have thought South Carolina would be 7-3 and three with a chance to go 9-3 and three at the year? And again, you're talking another three-loss SEC team. Do they have a shot? It's like everybody's got a shot, right? Tennessee, Georgia is the game of the week. Um, it's hard to believe Georgia at home is a 10-point favorite against Tennessee. Tennessee's never beaten Georgia. I think this is an elimination game. If Tennessee beats Georgia with three losses, I think Georgia's out. If Georgia beats Tennessee, again, we're going to be talking about five or six two-loss teams in the SEC. Tennessee, to me, this year is really good. 
I think they're really good defensively this year. I don't know if Nico's playing. I think he is. He's going through the concussion protocol. I think Tennessee goes there and beats them. Now, I think I would take Tennessee plus the 10, um, but I think they go in and I think they beat Georgia. I think they move to 9-1, and one, and I think Josh Heupel finishes the year off. I think Georgia is out, and I think Tennessee is in the college football playoff. And last but not least, Syracuse. Six and three Syracuse at Cal, who's five and four. You know what's crazy about this? Cal's an eight and a half point favorite. Eight and a half against Syracuse. Cal. I think Syracuse covers. Um, I think Syracuse beats Cal this week. Um, and Syracuse moves to seven and three. They think they'll beat Connecticut to go to eight and three, and then they'll take their shot against Miami. Uh, at the dome, the last game of the year, with a chance to go nine and three or eight and four. So I'm going to take Syracuse um, getting the points. So I hope everybody enjoyed tonight. I'm glad I was able to jump on tonight, talk some college football with you guys. I'll be back again next week. Um, the rock pile with uh, Coach Stan DeCosti. I'm just confirming another date with Coach. I'll probably only have a couple more episodes with Colgate football. The guys and I are working on another date for the No Huddle podcast. Um, to get the whole crew back together again and talk some college football. The Mohawk Valley Sports Watch, there's a lot going on. We'll see this week, Sunday, if we're going to give it a go. Um, reaching out to uh, some of the coaches that are still playing. Um, this week, I know Whitesboro uh, Boys Football is going. Coach Kramer, New Hartford Football, is playing tomorrow. And then the Rome Free Academy Girls Field Hockey Team is in the state Final Four. Um, I believe the Clinton Girls. Um, are also in the state final four this week. Um, so best of luck to all the local um, teams in the area this week. And um, I appreciate everybody for tuning in tonight. So thanks for tuning in, everybody, tonight on Facebook Live here on Chalk Talk with the Coach. Have a good evening, everybody.